In this video, I want to talk about details of epinephrine signaling cascade. We've been talking about general schemes so far. We're going to talk now about how exactly epinephrine, the hormone, uh, triggers a response in a cell. So what is epinephrine? Epinephrine is also known as adrenaline, and it's typically considered the fight or flight hormone. You may have heard that sort of phrase before. First thing we have to ask ourselves about epinephrine or adrenaline is what class of hormone is this? This is an amino acid derivative. Specifically, epinephrine is a uh, derivative of tyrosine. If you recall, tyrosine structure has the phenyl group with the OH on it, and this has that portion here. This is the actual structure of epinephrine. Now, are amino acid derivatives polar or nonpolar? Well, we were, if you recall, they were polar, which means that they'll act via a process in which they bind a receptor that's on the cell surface. And we'll see that epinephrine binds via a G protein coupled receptor. Epinephrine is released from a particular ductless gland called the adrenal medulla, which is actually right on top of the kidneys. And that's actually the reason that this hormone is named that. Epinephrine literally means on top of the 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 kidney and adrenaline on top of the kidney uh, nephr and renal both mean kidney epi um, and ad mean on top of at least in this case so there are some relevant functions that we want to consider when we think about epinephrine and adrenaline or adrenaline rather so the functions that we're going to be concerned with is that it acts on liver cells to increase blood glucose levels and it does that in two ways that we're going to at least talk about um, so it, what it can do is it's going to uh, if it wants to increase blood glucose that means it wants to free up glucoses right so it'll increase glycogen breakdown and increase gluconeogenesis in the liver does that make sense well, we want to increase blood glucose, right? So we want to free up glucose molecules. Well, if we're going to be breaking down glycogen, we're taking we're taking off a, you know a glucose at a time when we break down glycogen. So if we want to increase blood glucose levels, we're going to increase the breakdown of glycogen, break down the glycogen into into the glucose molecules. And we're also going to increase gluconeogenesis because gluconeogenesis, of course, makes glucose from pyruvates. Now, it also acts on muscle cells, right, which are cells elsewhere in the body. And what does it do there? It acts on muscle cells to make ATP. Now, how will it make ATP? A few ways. Well, it's going to increase glycogen breakdown. Actually, let me just keep the sort of same theme by writing this in green here. It'll increase glycogen breakdown. Does that make sense? Well, if we're going to break down glycogen, we're freeing up glucose. Okay, so, so far it doesn't necessarily make sense. But if we take those glucoses and we have them go through glycolysis, then we can make ATP. So now it makes sense. If, if we break down glycogen, free up glucoses, and allow those glucoses to go through glycolysis, we can make ATP. So it makes sense that we would increase glycogen breakdown and increase glycolysis in the muscle cells. And we'll talk more about why that makes sense in just a second. And we'd also increase beta oxidation. What is beta oxidation? That's the process in which we broke down fatty acids for energy. So our muscle cells would need energy. Why is this? Well, recall, epinephrine is the fight or flight hormone. So the fight or flight hormone, basically, you're going to need this hormone to go. It's released when you need to fight or you need to fly. So if you're going to fight or if you're going to fly away or run away from danger, then your muscles are going to need energy, right? They're going to need energy. They're going to need to make ATP. So, um, what exactly is going to happen here? The, um, the liver makes glucose, right? It increases blood glucose levels, and the muscle breaks glucose down to make ATP available for fighting or flying away. So your liver, its 
it's triggered by epinephrine to make glucose that your body that your muscles can use and then once your muscles have that glucose they're going to go ahead and and break it down for energy so notice that there's a commonality here between the functions in both the liver and the muscle cells we have increased glycogen breakdown or glycogen degradation so that's something I made a note here note that it happens in both organs so how exactly does that happen in these how is glycogen breakdown triggered by epinephrine in um, a liver or muscle cell by a G protein coupled receptor cascade so if we have a liver or muscle cell epinephrine is going to come on over and bind a G protein coupled receptor once it binds that it's going to the G protein will be activated now specifically in this case this is a stimulatory G protein so some some um, G proteins can be inhibitory so sti stimulatory G proteins are have this um, this S has a subscript <coughs> excuse me sorry about that so initially when it's inactive it has a GDP bound once it's activated it has a GTP bound so the GT the GTP bound alpha subunit of the G protein will head over to the adenylate cyclase and then adenylate cyclase what does that do it makes cyclic AMPs from ATP now we said before that these cyclic AMPs activate cyclic AMP dependent protein kinases now in the case of epinephrine that protein kinase specifically is protein kinase A so protein kinase A is going from a less active state to a more active state these cyclic AMPs uh, cause this protein kinase to be active now this protein kinase is going to go on ahead and activate um, excuse me it's, since it's active it's going to go ahead and um, be a kinase for proteins it's going to add phosphate to certain proteins now those proteins are certain enzymes that we're going to talk about here now before I actually go through and talk about this I want to refresh your memory um, about what these enzymes are so the enzymes that we're going to talk about are the target proteins the target proteins are glycogen synthase, phosphorylase kinase, and glycogen phosphorylase. What does glycogen synthase do? Well, the name kind of gives it away, right? It makes glycogen. So bear that in mind. What does phosphorylase kinase do? Well, it's a kinase, so it's going to add a phosphate group. And where is it going to add that phosphate group to? Phosphorylase. What phosphorylase? Glycogen phosphorylase. Which brings me here. Glycogen phosphorylase uh, degrades glycogen. So we should keep all of these functions in mind when we're thinking about this cascade. I wanted to refresh your memory. Now let's get back to it. So, protein kinase A, it's active, so it's going to add phosphates. It's going to add a phosphate to glycogen synthase and turn it into a glycogen synthase with a phosphate group. Where does it get that phosphate from? Well, it gets it from ATP, right? It's also going to add a phosphate group to phosphorylase kinase. So that also costs an ATP, right? The phosphate gets attached to phosphorylase kinase. Now, does adding the phosphate to glycogen synthase make it more or less active? Well, let's think about this for a second. Epinephrine, right, it's supposed to increase glycogen breakdown. So, if we want glycogen to be broken down, do we want glycogen synthase to be active? No, we don't want to be making glycogen, we want to be breaking it down. So, it's going to be going from a more active state to a less active state. Okay, however, phosphorylase kinase, is what does that do? That's the thing that adds a, phosph a phosphate group to, um, to glycogen phosphorylase. In this case, it's going from being less active to more active. Now, once phosphorylase kinase is active, it's going to add a phosphate group to glycogen phosphorylase. So it's going to add it from ATP. Now, glycogen phosphorylase, this is the enzyme that involved, involved in breaking down glycogen. Do we want this to be active according to epinephrine? Yep, we want to increase glycogen breakdown. So if we want to increase glycogen breakdown, we want to activate the enzyme that breaks it down. 
So it's going to go from a less active state to a more active state. So notice here, in this case, let me scroll up a bit. In this case, with glycogen synthase, adding the phosphate made it less active. But in the case of phosphorylase kinase and glycogen phosphorylase, adding the phosphates made them more active. So this is sort of explaining the idea that adding a phosphate doesn't necessarily make an enzyme more or less active. It depends on the enzyme itself. So now, notice that we have glycogen synthase less active, glycogen phosphorylase more active. Glycogen synthase, the thing that makes glycogen, it's less active. So if the thing that makes glycogen is less active, that means we're going to have less glycogen made. Okay. In addition, glycogen phosphorylase is more active. This is the thing that breaks down glycogen. So if it's more active, that means more glycogen will be broken down. The overall response is that less glycogen is made, more glycogen is broken down, which is exactly what we want in the case of epinephrine, right? We want that increased glycogen breakdown in both the liver and the muscle cells. So does this make sense? I sure hope so. The answer is yes. Why does it make sense? Well, you don't want the two opposing processes to be occurring at the same time, right? You don't want to be making glycogen at the same time as breaking it down. You don't want this enzyme and this enzyme active at the same time. You either want one active or the other active, assuming it's the same cell. And I wrote here, isn't it gnarly how one hormone binding event caused all of this? So just one hormone, right, one epinephrine bound here, and then it caused this crazy change. So, so what's going on here? This this amplification of this signal. That's called the cascade effect. How is the signal actually amplified? Well, if we think about this, one epinephrine molecule bound, maybe it created 10 cyclic AMPs. Each one of those cyclic AMPs can activate maybe 10 protein kinases. So maybe there are 100 protein kinases that are active. And then those 100 protein kinases, each one can activate 10, um, have 10 events. That means 1,000 glycogen synthases might be less active, and 1,000 phosphorylase kinases might be more active. So this is all from initially just one epinephrine binding. So this is the idea of an amplification of the signal. So how is the signal actually terminated? Well, there are three different ways. Three ways are you can either break cyclic AMP down uh, just to AMP. And basically that just makes that, that cyclic portion of the phosphate um, broken down. So that's catalyzed by cyclic nucleotide phosphodiesterase. It breaks that up. Um, a fun fact there is actually that this enzyme is inhibited by caffeine. So caffeine, you should know, is a stimulant, right? So um, if if you if, what it does is the way it works as a stimulant is it inhibits inhibits the process that stops the signal, right? So your body stays wired by by epinephrine. Epinephrine signal is not terminated if caffeine is around. So that basically allows the stimulatory effects to continue. If cyclic AMP is broken down, then these protein kinases won't be active anymore, right? Which would help in terminating the signal. Another thing is that the GTP on the G alpha subunit is hydrolyzed to a GDP. So up here, this G alpha subunit has a GTP, so it's active. If that gets hydrolyzed into a GDP, then it becomes inactive, right? And adenylate cyclase wouldn't make any more cyclic AMPs. So that would aid in terminating the signal. But what if that GTPase activity wasn't there? Well, then that would do very much the same thing as, as this whole idea of caffeine. It would keep that stimulatory effect going. Last thing is uh, protein phosphatases. They do is they remove phosphate groups from target proteins. So all these target proteins that have these phosphates groups on them, they can be taken off, and that would be that would also aid in terminating the signal. I hope that was all helpful. One last thing, I'm a tutor. If you live in Southern California, feel free to contact me via email at mufuniversity at gmail.com.
Hope that video was helpful. See the description for more details. Thanks for watching.